Hello and welcome to Lost Love Chronicles. I wish that I could tell you in some sophisticated or unusual way that I discovered that my wife was cheating on me, but I can't. It happened like an old cliche from a bad story. I work for an auto parts manufacturer. I make breaks. Somebody has to do it and I am one of the lucky ones. From 4 to midnight every day, 5 days a week, for 8 hours, I operate one of the most archaic machines you have ever seen. I get to wear eye protectors, earplugs, steel-toed shoes, and a denim apron. I meet my quota every day, and if I am lucky, I get a bonus at the end of the year. I have a nice little three-bedroom home, a pretty wife, and two sons, both in grade school. After 12 years of marriage, things were looking good, until today. We have five stations that put the shoes together. They all run off of compressed air. In eight years, we have had no problems with the equipment. Today, halfway through the shift, the compressed air system froze up. The air used to operate all our machines has to be perfectly dry. It is filtered and dehydrated by automatic equipment that never fails. Well, almost never. Tonight, the dehydrator system failed to vent the collected moisture. I am not a scientist. So all I know is that when moisture and high-pressure air get together, there is freezing, and everything comes to a complete halt. Rather than have us sit around, they just sent the whole crew home, without pay of course. I guess you could say my whole life was ruined by high humidity. When I opened the bedroom door, all I saw was a large, hairy, back, bouncing up and down on my wife, Marcy. Of course I instinctively turned on the overhead light when I realized Marcy wasn't sleeping. God damn it, Danny. What the hell are you doing home? I was expecting her to be scared, apologetic and ashamed, but all I got was a pissed off witch. What the hell is going on? Oh, don't be such a jerk. You know perfectly well what is going on. I am sorry you had to see it, but if you had come home when you were supposed to, it never would have happened. He never would have been here, or I never would have seen him. The hairy back had turned over and was now glaring at me with a smirk on his face. Marcy pulled the covers up in a half-assed attempt at modesty. My big mistake was grabbing the guy. When he came off the bed, he was a lot bigger than when he was lying down. For my foolish enthusiasm, I was rewarded with two very, very hard blows to the ribs. I never got to lay a punch on him, and I was on the floor, trying like hell to catch my breath. I am not sure, but I think I got a smash to the side of the head about that time, which put me out. Somehow or other, I found myself in the hospital emergency room, getting my ribs bandaged by some sort of medical technician. Marcy was sitting on the chair beside the examination table with a disgusted look on her face. The technician finished and left the room. Marcy, who the hell was that guy and what was he doing in our house? His name is Tony. He is a friend of mine and I invited him to the house. You were screwing him. You were screwing him in our bed. Our kids were just down the hall sleeping. Yes, I know. If you hadn't made such a commotion, they never would have woken up. I had to get my sister to watch them so I could bring you down here. What the hell was he doing there? How many times are you going to ask the same question? We were having sex. We were fornicating. Is that so difficult to understand? Is this a regular thing or was this the only time? Tony and I have been getting together for about six months now. We were trying to keep it a secret from you. We don't normally come to the house though, but I couldn't get a sitter. Is it over now? No, it is not over. Danny, you are a good father and a good husband, but Tony is great in bed. I don't see any reason for us to end it just because it is out in the open. I promise you that we will not get together at the house anymore. It is not fair to you or the kids. I am sorry, Marcy. That is not acceptable. It stops now. Danny, if you try to stop my relationship with Tony in any way, I can guarantee that you will regret it. You just got the shit beat out of you, and Tony didn't even raise a sweat. I can assure you that it will happen again. If you do or say anything, everybody we know will find out that your wife is screwing another man, and you are too much of a bum to stop it. All our friends and neighbors will find out first. I will see to it that your family knows all about what a pathetic loser you are. The guys that you work with will start to call you a cock. Think twice, Danny. Your life will be hell. I bet even your sons will be embarrassed by you. Don't you care what anybody thinks of you? You would make yourself look like a 304 just to put me down. I will if I have to, but I am betting that you won't take that chance. Tony thinks you are a bum, and I think he is right. You are going to have to learn to live with it, Danny boy. Who the hell is this guy anyhow? Where does he work? He doesn't work, Danny. He owns Continental Classics the luxury car emporium on Lancaster Pike. You know, the place you always wanted to go into but never did. That's it. Danny, he is richer than you are, he is smarter than you are, and he is better in bed than you are. It also appears 
that he is stronger and better with his fist than you are. Why don't you just marry him if he is so damn great? That's why I keep you around, darling. Tony doesn't like kids, and I have no intention of giving mine up so I can be with him. You get to play house husband and daddy while Tony gets all the loving. Why is that so hard for you to understand? I am supposed to like this arrangement? You have no choice. You either live with it or the whole world will find out what a loser you are. By the way, I am moving all your things into the guest room. I don't think it is necessary for us to share the bed anymore, since the cat is out of the bag. I watched as Marcy got up to leave. I was sort of glad to see her go. Just curious, darling. But who took care of the kids when you were out with Tony? Karen usually watched them, but once in a while I dropped them off at your parents' house. Oh, by the way, Karen is the one who introduced me to Tony. I made a mental note to thank Karen as Marcy left the room. They released me the next morning. Marcy wasn't there. I had a choice of calling someone or taking a taxi, the taxi one. The kids were in school and Marcy was not at home. All of my clothing and personal items were piled on the guest bed. I am sure that Todd and Terry would have questions about the arrangements. I was going to let Marcy explain it. It took less than an hour to get my new living quarters in order. All sorts of ideas were running through my head in the meantime. There was no way in hell this was going to play out as Marcy planned it. The first thing I did was go to the basement and dig out my old phone recorder. It would only work on the landline phone, but I had no other option. Marcy used her cell phone for almost all her calls. It only took 20 minutes to hook it up and hide it behind some old paint cans. It was a first step. I was feeling like shit, but I was good enough to go back to work. They gave me a few pains pills, but I wasn't nuts about taking them and then operating machinery. I grabbed a couple of heavy-duty Tylenols instead. One thing Marcy had grossly miscalculated was my relationship with the guys who I worked with. I told them everything that happened the previous evening. They all had ideas, some good and some bad. It felt good to know that friends would be there for you when you needed them. We had an eight-hour shift ready to start, and each was going to spend it thinking up ways to make things right. We broke for supper in the middle of the shift. Okay, did anybody come up with an idea? Glenn was the first to speak up. I don't have an idea, but I do have a cousin who works for the son of a witch. He does all the detailing of the vehicles. From what I understand, he hates DeMarco. If you need any information about the business, the buildings, or the work shifts, he can help you. That will definitely be a help, Glenn. Anybody else? Danny, I got two shotguns and two pistols. You're welcome to any of them. None of them are registered, so there is no worry there. Thanks, Barry, but that sounds a little bit more drastic than I was hoping for. Well, hell, you don't even want to hear my idea then. There was a little laughter at Freddy's remark. Tell us, Freddy. Come on, tell us. I thought we could tie him to a tree with his legs spread out and build a bonfire, Indian style between his legs. Everybody loved Freddy's idea, but it got voted down unanimously. Kyle was the only one that hadn't offered anything, so we all just looked at him while we ate our lunches. What? Don't look at me like that. Yeah, I got an idea, but it is sort of flaky. Spill it, Kyle. I remember reading somewhere about a prison in Arizona that dressed all of the sex criminals in pink jumpsuits. It was supposed to be humiliating. I know this Tony guy isn't a child molester, but something like that would embarrass the hell out of him. You mean put a pink jumpsuit on him? Wouldn't he just take it off? I was thinking that if you could get in there, tie him up, and then spray paint him all over with pink paint that might do the trick. But he would know who did it. You have to make him unconscious first, and then leave him tied to the chair until they find him. How? Do we do it with drugs, or hit him over the head? What do you have in mind? I can get a taser. All you have to do is sneak up and zap him. You make that sound easier than it probably is. How do we get him when he is alone, and how do we get close enough without him knowing? I don't have all the answers. I just thought it was an idea. The buzzer rang, and it was back to another four hours on the machines. My quota for the night was down, so the other guys chipped in to even it up. Marcy was in bed when I got home. At least she was keeping her word about not bringing the a-hole into the house. I didn't have any clue as to what I would do. Most of the stuff the guys and I talked about were like high school pranks. I might as well put a flaming bag of dog poop on his doorstep. I needed some real revenge. It was noon when I got up. The kids were at school and I could hear Marcy moving around in the house. I grabbed a quick shower, shaved, and started out the door. Good morning, husband. Don't you have a kiss for your wife? She was standing by the kitchen sink with her hand on her hip and a smirk on her face. I just turned and walked out the door. Her smart-ass remark did not deserve an answer. I needed some lunch and some private time. I spent the rest of the afternoon killing time. 
I was trying to figure out what I could do to my wife's sex buddy without bringing too much havoc upon myself. I had to finish work tonight and start getting prepared. I decided to stop taking any meals at home. It was about the only time I got to spend with the boys, but I just couldn't force myself to eat Marcy's cooking anymore. Before I knew it, it was time for work. Things were pretty normal until supper break. Danny, I got the taser in the car. I don't know if you can use it for anything, but at least you can have it for self-protection. Call seemed proud of himself. Don't forget to pick it up before you go home. Did you ever use the damn thing? No. We can try it out. Who wants to volunteer? The only response was a chorus of groans around the table. Nobody had any new ideas, but they all were willing to support anything I came up with. I felt better knowing that I had a few friends. Things were normal at the house when I got home. It would be a short night for me. Working the graveyard shift sort of screws up your sleeping habits, especially on the weekends. I was up earlier than normal. Todd and Terry jumped at the chance to spend some time at Chuck E. Cheese. Marcy didn't seem to mind at all, especially when I told her we would be out all day. Danny, I am going to need you to take a few vacation days the week after next. Tony's friend Wally is coming in from Detroit, and we are going to be taking a three-night, for day cruise down to Cancun. If you can't do it, could you see if your parents can? Let me get this straight. You are going to take a sea cruise with two guys? That sounds a little sleazy, even for you. Don't be crude, Danny. It doesn't fit you. Wally will be rooming with Karen. They're old friends for a couple of years. Oh. Well, golly gee, I guess that makes it all right then. I tried my best to be sarcastic. I definitely would be thanking Karen later. Of course, I got started on the day way too early. In order to kill some time before Chucky's open, we went to the Hobby Lobby near the house. The boys were big enough to put together most of the plastic models that lined the shelves. The end results were not anything to brag about, but they had a lot of fun. I left them to explore the hundreds of boxes and wandered around amazing myself at all the crap that was available for creative housewives to buy. I guess if Marcy had been into crafts, she wouldn't have brought home that hairy gorilla. It was too late now. My eyes lit up when I discovered rows and rows of designer paint and spray cans. There they were, six beautiful cans of pink paint and aerosol cans. They didn't have as much paint in them as the ones at Lowe's or Home Depot, but they were pink. It was the only place I saw paint that color in a spray can. Of course, I took this as a sign and bought all six cans. Todd ended up with a monster truck kit and Terry opted for the tugboat. I didn't even know they made plastic tugboat models. Before we left, I also picked up a package of 10 large plastic cable wraps. They were about 18 inches long and looked like they would do the job. By that time, Chuck E. Cheese was ready for business. The kids killed about four hours and two pizzas before they burned out. We picked up a pack of cheap bread and went to Pandora Park. The ducks ate it all in the first 10 minutes, but we stuck around for another couple hours before heading for my parents' house. Mom and Dad were happy to have us for supper and the evening. Todd and Terry spent most of the night in front of the television, and I took advantage of the time to brief Dad on the situation with Marcy. I realized that I was actually telling people about what was going on before Marcy could. She was threatening to do what I was doing myself. Hell, that almost made her threat worthless. Dad promised that they would be there to take care of the boys no matter what happened. That would make things a lot easier to carry out. I didn't want the boys hurt by the situation. About 9 o'clock, I called Marcy to let her know we would be staying at my parents' house for the night. I got the machine. After a big breakfast at IHOP, we arrived home to find Marcy still in bed. I immediately fired up the lawn mower and started in the back, by the bedrooms. Todd and Terry were anxious to start on their models even though it was a beautiful day outside. I let them go. I decided to make a full day of the lawn work. There was edging and pruning to be done. Things didn't go as fast as normal because I found myself stopping to chat a lot. I had a perfectly good pair of hedge clippers, but decided to borrow a set from Mike Fielding across the street. His wife, Mary, was one of the biggest gossips in the neighborhood. I explained to Mike that there might be some unfamiliar cars parked by the house, because Marcy would be entertaining some male friends. Everything should be okay unless they get drunk and rowdy. If that happens, just call the police. It was hard for me to control things, since I worked nights. Larry Finley was on the board of directors at the local church. I borrowed a spark plug wrench from him and apologized for Marcy's recent wild behavior. Of course he wanted to know what I meant. Larry was a bigger gossip than Mary Fielding. Ten minutes later, he had enough fodder to last a month. I didn't break for lunch and finished work about four in the afternoon. 
After a quick shower, I went to Rosie's Cantina and ordered the most expensive meal on the menu. I am not sure what it was, but it sure was good. I spent the rest of the evening with my brother Dave and his family. Dad had already told him what was going on. I spent the night on his couch. My wife had a great plan. She was going to force me into obedience by threatening to expose me as a cuck. If I refused to condone and support her infidelity, she would make my life miserable. It was an interesting idea, but it sure had a lot of holes in it. In less than a week, I had already told everybody what was going on. That sort of negated her threat. I was also able to make her look more like a cheap 304 than she had ever imagined. I don't think she ever anticipated any backlash. I stopped by the house the next afternoon to change for work and a fuming Marcy was waiting for me. What the hell have you been telling the neighbors? Karen said that you told everyone that I was running an escort house here at night. Oh bullshit. That is not true Marcy. I simply explained to them that you might be entertaining men while I was at work and that they shouldn't get excited about it. Well, that's not how it is going around. Whom else have you been talking to? Everybody. I figured I would tell them before you did. It seemed easier that way. I didn't say anything to your parents or your sisters. You should probably do that before they hear the rumors. Damn it, Danny. You are making me look like a 304. Well, that's only fair. You are going to make me look like a cock. A hole. I am sorry, darling, but I have to get to work. I got to spend a little time with the boys before leaving. The hardest part was not getting the quality time that I wanted with them. Glenn had the best news of the night. Continental Classics closed down at 9 o'clock on Thursday night so that Tony could personally make out all the paychecks for Friday. He hated to be disturbed while doing the payroll, so even the cleaning crew was gone. Carl took a few minutes and showed me how to use the taser. Nobody would volunteer to test it. The plan was coming together. If I got caught, and I fully expected to, I would be looking at some jail time. I didn't give a shit. Tony DeMarco had to be humiliated. If I got arrested, I would make sure that all the newspapers and TV stations got the complete story. Any publicity like that would crush him, or at least piss him off so bad that he did something dumb. For the next few days, I went home only to sleep, shower, and change clothes. I hadn't eaten a meal at home since that first day. Finally, Thursday arrived. I arranged for my truck to have a dead battery, so Kyle picked me up. The floor supervisor never really bothered the brake guys too much. As long as we met our quotas and the quality was good, they left us alone. One thing that would work to my advantage was the OSHA requirements for the job. Between the apron, gloves, and welding goggles, we all pretty much looked alike. At 8.30, I slipped out the back door. The guys would be taking turns working my station. One of their posts would, of course, be vacant, but no one really cared. Toilet breaks were routine and never controlled. The main thing was to give the illusion that I never left. I walked into the employee's door at Continental Classics and headed straight for the bathroom. At about 9 o'clock, somebody made a quick check before turning out the lights. Ten minutes later, I put on some latex gloves and walked out of the toilet into a semi-dark office area. His desk overlooked the showroom area, so his back was to the door. It looked like it was going to be easier than I expected. He had a computer in front of him, but he was pecking away on an old adding machine with paper tape. He never heard me approach. I hit Tony with the taser right on the back of his neck. His body jerked upright and I thought he was going to turn around, so I let him have it again. This time he gave a few twitches and then relaxed. Perfect. I put two plastic cable wraps on each leg and two on each arm. I brought an old necktie along to use as a blindfold. He was being very cooperative. I wheeled his chair over to the glass window by the showroom. He would be in perfect view when his people showed up for work in the morning. It was a pretty pink color, but I had to use a lot more than I anticipated. The paint was being absorbed into his clothing as fast I sprayed it on. It took at least three coats on any one area to show up like I wanted it to. I had just enough paint, but barely. He looked pretty in pink. After I finished, I carefully packed everything back up. I had expected Tony to wake up while I was decorating him, but he never budged. I had also planned to remove the necktie blindfold before leaving. I checked my watch several times. I was well within the time frame I had laid out, but I still wanted Tony awake before I left. Five minutes later, I was starting to worry. I tried to feel for a pulse with no success. Maybe I couldn't feel it because of the latex gloves. I took a glove off and tried again. There was still no pulse. I tried to find a pulse on his neck, like I saw them do on TV. I still couldn't find anything. I removed the blindfold and then touched his eyeball with a pencil tip. He didn't blink. There was no kind of reflex. Well, 
Needless to say, I started to panic. I did have the presence of mind to put the latex glove back on and wipe everything that I might have touched. I put the necktie in my pocket and then cut off all the plastic ties. You could see the marks that the pink paint left when I removed them. It looked odd. The white skin under the necktie made him look like a pink raccoon. I took another minute to make sure I didn't overlook anything and then left for work. I dropped all the crap that I had with me, including the taser, into a storm sewer on the way back to the shop. Ten minutes later, I was back making brake shoes. Nobody noticed that I was absent. As soon as the shift was over, I told the guys what happened. They were all accessories, so I was pretty sure nobody would say anything. Freddy was very impressed. None of them seemed worried. Kyle drove me home, and we both made a mental note of the time that he dropped me off. I didn't get to sleep as long as I usually did. At about 10 o'clock, Marcy came barging into my room. What the hell did you do? What did you do, you little a-hole? Of course, I just rolled over and gave her a perplexed look. What the heck are you talking about, woman? Tony's dead. Karen called and said they found him in his office this morning, dead. I believe that you had something to do with it, and I will see to it that you pay, you a-hole. That was the second time she called me a-hole in five minutes. It was pretty clear that I was not going to be getting any more sleep, so I stumbled out of bed and hit the john. I was in no hurry to face the Wicked Witch of the East, so I took a long hot shower and a slow shave. I even put on a little aftershave, just to aggravate my loving wife. I never made it to the coffee pot. A tall man was standing in the living room, talking to Marcy. His hair was cut very close, and he had on a dark suit. The witch had called the cops. There was no doubt about it. I shook my head and walked into the kitchen, to get my first cup of the day. Marcy had a sarcastic little smirk on her face, as I sat down in my favorite recliner. My uninvited guest sat when I did. Mr. Mercer, my name is Detective Darnell Green, with an E. I am here concerning the death of Anthony DeMarco last night. Your wife indicated that you and Mr. DeMarco had a disagreement last week, and I was wondering if I could ask you a few questions. Sure. I have no objections, but not here. What do you mean? If you want to talk, let's do it in your office, not in my home. Is that okay with you? I couldn't help but notice the frown that came across Marcy's face. I was pretty sure that she had expected to be included in the discussion. My car or yours, Mr. Mercer? I have a few other things I need to do, so I'll meet you there. Any special office? Second floor rear. Room 206. Just turn right when you get off the elevator. I'll see you shortly. Marcy was fuming as I put on my shoes. I never got to finish the coffee, so I just dumped it in the sink. I turned and smiled as I walked out of the door. I guess you were going to get what you wanted, sweetheart. What are you talking about? What the hell do you mean, Danny? Ten minutes later and I was sitting with Detective Green on the second floor in the municipal building. For the next hour, Detective Green asked all the right questions and I had all the right answers. He was trying to be discreet about the affair without ignoring it or rubbing it in my face. Of course, I had to admit that I had a motive, but that I never got a chance to do anything about it. It was a serious situation, but I tried my best to be congenial without being a smartass. I think he appreciated the fact that I made his job easier, even thought I didn't have an answer for him. The most interesting part of the discussion was finding out that Tony died from some sort of heart problem. He had a pacemaker installed a couple of years ago, and I guess it didn't mix too well with the taser. Of course, they knew about the taser from the marks on his neck. I felt bad that Tony died, and yet I was also glad. Detective Green gave me the usual, don't leave town speech, and said he would get back with me, after verifying my alibi. Wow, I never thought I would need an alibi for anything. It was sort of exciting. We parted on good terms. I got the feeling that Darnell Green was on my side. It made me feel warm all over. I grabbed a bite to eat and watched the TV news. There was a segment about the death of a local businessman. It mentioned that there were no no relatives in the area. I emptied the bank accounts and then took the time to have a nice breakfast. There were things to be done at home. Marcy was not there when I got back. It took me 30 minutes to move all of my things back into the master bedroom and all of Marcy's things into the guest room. The guest room had one small closet and one dresser. I piled everything on the bed for her to put away. I checked the telephone recorder in the basement and there was nothing significant on it. I gathered up all of the banking and insurance records as well as other important papers. I was glad that I had Marcy's Volvo in my name. That would make things easier. Everything went into a folder under the front seat of my truck. I called work and took two weeks vacation. A few hours later, my loving wife showed up. She seemed surprised to find me at home. It was time to get things in order again. 
I smiled as I led her to the guest room. What the hell is this? Who the hell do you think you are? Her reply was a big smile. Answer me, damn it. What is going on? Marcy, I will be staying in the master bedroom from now on. You can have the guest room. I suggest that you start putting your clothing away. Anything that is not in the closet or the dresser by supper time will be disposed of. Any questions? I can't get my stuff in that little closet, and I have no intention of staying in that room anyhow. What the hell do you mean, disposed of? If you can't get it in the closet or the dresser, you don't need it. This is not going to happen, Danny. I don't know what kind of game you think you are playing, but it will not work. You are dead meat. I suggest that you start putting things in order. If you have any more questions, I'll check back later. A-hole. That was the third time today she called me a-hole. I must be doing something right. While Marcy was busy in the guest room, I dumped her purse on the kitchen table. I took my time collecting everything that I wanted. I got her cell phone first, and then her car keys. From her wallet, I got her driver's license and all the credit cards, debit cards, and money. I put back everything that was left. I got her car title out of the pickup, and then drove the Volvo across town to a friend of mine who had a car lot. I sold it to him outright, at a good price, with the agreement that he would wholesale it out of town. Even with the payoff, I got a few thousand dollars in my pocket. I was just going into Taco Bell for lunch when my cell phone rang. You son of a witch, what did you do with my cell phone? And where the hell is my car? I was happy that she didn't call me in a hole again. She was calling from the house phone. It was a good test. I could check the recorder when I got home. I am sorry, honey. I had to get money to hire a lawyer to defend me from the murder charges. I promised to get you another car as soon as I get out of jail. She was still cussing on the other end as I hung up and turned the cell phone off. After that conversation, I decided a lawyer would really be a good idea. No matter what happened, I was not going to stay married. It would have to wait, however, because I was next in line to order. Todd and Terry were home when I got there. I went straight to my son's and ignored Marcy altogether. I did glance her way a few times and noticed that she was not a happy camper. The boys were anxious to show me the models that they had put together. When Marcy started to put supper together, I wandered down the hall to the guest room. All of my clothes were back on the bed. All of Marcy's clothes were back in the master bedroom. I snickered to myself, but decided not to fight it. She was hard-headed and determined right now. Marcy told the boys to wash up for supper, and I went to the guest room to put my things away, again. I would have loved to throw all her stuff away, but that seemed too childish. Red Lobster was my treat to myself tonight. Money was no object, because I still had cash left over after giving the divorce lawyer a deposit. The shrimp and lobster combo was great, but the cheese rolls were still my favorite. When I finished my meal, I turned my cell phone back on. I was hoping that one of the guys from work or Detective Green might call. No such luck, as the first call was from my wife. Danny, how am I supposed to go to the grocery store? We need milk as well as a few other things. I'll take you when I get home. Try and arrange it so that we can do the shopping on Saturdays when I am off work. I'll feel better if you didn't do the shopping by yourself. Oh. I got another call. I got to go. We'll talk when I get home. The second call was from Kyle. Detective Green talked to the whole crew, individually and as a group. All of the stories held up. Tom Tingle, the floor manager, was the strongest supporter. He insisted that there was no way I could have missed work. He kept a tight rein on all of his men and can guarantee that I was there all night. I knew that I wasn't that clever. If some criminal investigator wanted to prove that I killed Tony DeMarco, I am sure that he could do it. I was getting the feeling that nobody cared. I got home just in time to put the boys to bed. Marcy was sitting on the couch with a glass of wine. I grabbed a cold Foster's from the fridge and got comfortable in my recliner. The TV was not on, so I figured it was a good time for Marcy and I to talk. So Marcy, how is the plan to turn me into a bum and a cut coming along? Well, that ended the conversation before it got started. She finished the wine, got up, and left for her bedroom. I thought she wanted to talk. I guess I was wrong. I took my beer and went to check the recorder. The first call was to her sister. There was no cover up there. It appeared that Marge knew all about the affair with Tony and was supporting Marcy in every way. That was good to know. The next call was to Marcy's mom and was a little different. Mom had no idea what was going on. Her daughter convinced her that Tony was a friend of Karen's and that I was jealous because I had been trying to have sex with Karen for years. Tony gave me a lecture about it and I got mad. She never said that I killed him, but she sure did infer it. She called the cell phone company to see if she could get a replacement for the phone that I took.
and didn't have any success. Then she called the DMV to report that I took her driver's license. They told her to report it to the cops. She called the bank to ask for a replacement credit card, but they told her the account was closed. I will say this, she was busy little girl. The last call on the machine was to Karen. Karen lived only a few houses away, so I have no idea why they used the phone instead of just getting together. Of course, it was to my benefit. I learned two important things from that call. Wally was still coming in from Detroit, and that Marcy was going to lay low and not make any waves until he got here. The boys and I were up, bright and early the next day. We were out of the house before Marcy was awake. We got home after lunch and Marcy insisted that I drive her to the grocery store. She needed things and since she no longer had a car or a driver license, I had to take care of it. That night, while she cooked supper, I checked the recorder. Wally had arrived and the first person he called was Marcy. It was an interesting conversation. He believed everything that Marcy told him and vowed revenge. Wally and Tony grew up together and he would not let this go. He gave Marcy the number where he was staying and told her to call him the next day when she got a chance. Marcy immediately called Karen and enthusiastically gushed about how happy she was. I could not believe that this was the woman that I was married to all these years. The change was so sudden and so complete. I had no idea that what I did was so bad that I deserved this, other than killing her lover. I went out for a burger before going to bed. Of course, the lawn needed mowing again, so the next day I had a good excuse to avoid Marcy. About 11 o'clock, Marcy's mom and dad came to pick up the boys. I had no idea that a sleepover with the in-laws had been planned, but decided not to protest it. Tomorrow was a school day, and Grandmom Wilcox promised that they would be there on time. I was anxious to check the phone recorder, but lunch came first since I missed breakfast. After a quick shower, I was off to Denny's. Marcy never said a thing about the fact that I was no longer eating at home. Marcy and Wally had set up a plan to avenge Tony's death. The whole thing was sort of comical. I guess it wouldn't have seemed that way if I didn't know what was going on. After Marcy and I went to bed, Wally was going to enter the house through the sliding door off the back deck. She promised him that it would be unlocked. If everything went according to plan, it would look as if I was shot during a burglary attempt. Marcy and Karen would both call 911 when they heard the shot. I know it sounds stupid, but at that moment I remembered that I had not changed the beneficiaries on my insurance policies. I threw my wife a sarcastic kiss as I walked out the door and got a finger in response. I had supper with my parents and spent the evening there. Before I left, I borrowed Dad's snake charmer. The short-barreled 20-gauge would be perfect for the evening party. Marcy was in bed when I got home, but her light was on and I assumed that she was reading. The only call on the recorder was from Karen. She was bragging about the great sex she and Wally enjoyed all afternoon. Before saying goodbye, she promised Marcy that she would be ready later that night. It took me about 20 minutes to replace the buckshot in the shells with rock salt. I had a full bag left over from last winter. I didn't want to kill Wally, but just slow him down. Hell, I didn't want to kill Tony either. I was hoping that Wally didn't have a bad ticker like Tony did. I wanted to check the door to the back deck, but was afraid that Wally might see me. I had to assume that Marcy left it unlocked. I stripped down to my shorts and messed up the blankets on the bed. A cup of coffee would have been nice, but there was none made, so I settled for a Coke. I waited in my recliner with the cell phone by my side. He didn't show up until after midnight. As soon as I saw him on the deck, I dialed 911 and reported an intruder in my house. I was careful to say that I was in fear for my life. I didn't hang up the phone. The patio door quietly slid open and there was Wally. I waited until he was completely inside the house and then gave him the first blast. I was aiming for the lower part of his body because I didn't want to accidentally kill the son of a witch. The first shot knocked him back under the deck. When the second one hit him, he fell over the side of the deck, breaking the railing. I knew I didn't kill him because he was howling like a stuck pig. Boy, that rock salt must have really hurt. I was astounded by how loud the sound of the shotgun blast was inside the house. My ears were ringing like crazy. I flicked on the lights and in a matter of seconds Marcy was standing in the living room screaming. She was actually yelling words at me, but I couldn't make them out. I walked over to see how Wally was and saw a Ruger .22 automatic with a silencer attached on the floor. Marcy was still screaming, so I pointed the shotgun in her direction. She quickly shut up and ran out of the room. It looked like Wally broke his ankle when he fell. Some guys have all the luck. Ten minutes later, the first black and white arrived. There wasn't a whole lot of discussion. 
I had laid the shotgun on the floor so that there would be no misinterpretation of what was going on. I pointed to the phone, and one of the officers informed the 911 operator that everything was under control. They asked who else was in the house, and I told them about Marcy in the bedroom. They brought her into the living room and discovered that they made a big mistake. Her mouth was running a mile a minute. I tried to block it out as the police tried to shut her up. Neither one of us was successful. Finally, a larger-than-life, female, uniformed officer gently took her arm and led her outside. I noticed that Karen was standing outside with some other's neighbors. I smiled at her and slowly drew my index finger across my throat. She turned and rapidly walked away without returning my smile. The EMT unit arrived for Wally at the same time that Detective Green showed up. He smiled when he saw me and I responded with a big grin. I wasn't trying to be a smartass, but I just couldn't help myself. The Amazon cop brought Marcy back into the house so that she could get dressed. She had calmed down a little. After I got dressed, we all headed down for police headquarters. I insisted on separate cars, so Detective Green let me ride with him. We didn't talk on the way downtown, but he did look over at me and smile again. It was daylight when Green turned me loose. We only talked for about 30 minutes, but they kept me around for the whole night. I felt like I was at Guantanamo because they kept making me drink coffee. One of the black and white cars drove me home. I was a little disappointed because I was expecting to see yellow tape strung around the house. The place looked like nothing happened. The rock salt didn't even break the siding glass door. I guess Wally got most of it. I figured it would take about an hour to fix the busted railing. I hit the bed and didn't get up until after lunch. After emptying my bladder, I staggered out to the kitchen and found my friendly detective sitting at the table reading the paper and drinking fresh coffee, which I assumed he made while I was sleeping. I had all the coffee I wanted the night before, so I settled for a large glass of OJ and sat down across from him. I have no idea how he got into the house. You are one cool dude, Mr. Mercer. He never looked up from the paper. I didn't know how to respond to that, so I said nothing. I couldn't tell if he was playing with me or what. He finished his coffee. Detective Green, I need a shower, a shave, and some lunch. I'll buy, unless it's against some sort of police policy. Take your time, Danny. I got all day. As I walked to the shower, I was wondering when he slept. Lunch was two big pulled pork sandwiches. Green even joined me in washing it down with a beer. Neither one of us said anything, and after a while the silence became overwhelming. You are dying to ask me some questions, aren't you, Mr. Mercer? Funny, but I was thinking the same thing about you. My detective friend waved the waiter over and ordered two more drafts. I spent all night asking you questions. It's your turn now. Okay, for starters, where is my wife? We are still holding her. She will be charged this afternoon. I finished my beer. Your wife's parents got her a lawyer. I was not expecting that. Now I had a hundred more questions, but the trouble was that the more questions I asked, the more I risked exposing myself. I decided it was better to back off. It was nice to see that Marcy's family was available for her, because I wasn't going to be there. I don't have any more questions, Detective Green, but if you feel the need to unburden yourself, feel free to start any time. He took a big swig of beer and laughed, not loud, but a definite laugh. One more thing. You didn't happen to overhear or maybe tape any conversations that your wife had with Mr. Williams, did you? I assume you mean Wally? That got me a little sneer. If I did happen to have such a tape, would you need it? I don't know yet. If things go as I think they will, it won't make any difference. But if one of them gets a good lawyer, maybe. If I had such a tape, wouldn't that get me in trouble? You were right about that. I'm just trying to make my job easier. I'll see what I can do without having a tape that may or may not exist. I nodded a little thank you. Danny boy, I think I should take you home. Your boys will be getting back from school soon. And they need their father. We arrived at the house just as the school bus dropped off Todd and Terry. They walked over to us and I introduced them to my new detective friend. They wanted to see his batch. Everything seemed pleasant enough until Green leaned forward and said, Now which one of you built the tugboat? And which one built the monster truck? I built the truck, shouted Todd with his chest out. I did the tugboat. Do you want to see it? Terry was just as proud. Maybe I'll get a chance to look at them next time. I have to go now. He left me standing there stunned and walked to his car with a big shit-eating smile on his face. The son of a witch knew about the pink paint. He had my balls in his hand, and I couldn't do a damn thing about it. We ordered a pizza that night. The boys never asked where their mom was. After supper, Marcy's dad called and said he needed some help to raise the bail money to get her out of jail. I tried to be as polite as I could be, 
when I turned him down. I am not sure that he understood what was going on, but at least he was trying to be a good father. I asked him where she was going to stay. He hesitated a little and then said that she would be staying with him. The boys and I loaded all of Marcy's things in the pickup and dropped them off. We had no trouble gathering everything up. When we came home, I noticed a U-Haul truck in the driveway at Karen's house. It was gone the next morning. Marcy never called me. I had to read the newspaper every day to find out what was going on. Nobody told me anything. In fact, it was almost like I was purposely being left out of the loop. There was no trial. Marcy placed all the blame on Wally. Wally claimed it was all her idea. Both of them ended up taking pleas. Marcy got three to five years for conspiracy to commit murder. Wally got five to ten years for attempted murder. Some federal people were called in concerning the silencer that Wally had with him. They decided to wait until Wally finished his first sentence before bringing changes. Detective Green didn't need the tape and never mentioned it again. Karen vanished and was not seen or heard from again. My dad was glad to get his shotgun back and promised that I could borrow it again if I needed it. He was snickering when he said that. I had Marcy served with divorce papers as soon as she started her jail term. She did not protest anything. I got the feeling that she didn't want anything to do with me because I hadn't seen her or talked to her since the night I shot Wally. I sold the house and moved back in with my parents. I couldn't work and watch the boys myself. The guys at work were happy to have me back. For some reason, I was offered the chance to change over to the day shift, but I turned it down. I took the boys up to Muncie Women's Prison to see their mother every month. I waited in the car, because they usually were there less than an hour. Sometimes, in good weather, the meetings would be outside. I was able to park and watch them through the chain-link fence. I never asked them about the visits, and I asked them not to tell me anything. It seemed to work fine for all of us. Things seemed to be running smoothly until I got the phone call. Hello, is this Daniel Mercer? Yes. My name is Angela Hawkins. A detective named Darnell Green said that I should call you. There are a thing that we need to discuss. I know Detective Green, but why would you want to talk to me? Tony DeMarco was my brother. Oh shit. Just when I thought all this crap was behind me, something like this has to happen. I don't think that would be a good idea. I am sorry for your loss, but I can't help you. I hung up the phone before she could say anything else. Two days later, she called again. Daniel, I would really appreciate if you could come to see me. There are some things I need to say. Detective Green said you were a reasonable man. Where did you want to meet? I would prefer to do it at the auto showroom, but anywhere you feel comfortable is fine with me. It took me a few moments to come up with something. I will meet you Saturday morning at 10 o'clock at the showroom. I will be bringing my two sons with me. They like looking at old cars. I didn't know what she had in mind, but I felt safer in a public place, with the boys along. I wasn't using them as a shield or anything like that but I felt that she would be less likely to try anything if I had them with me. I had no idea what sort or grudge this woman might be harboring. If she was Tony's sister, she must be Italian. If she was Italian, she must be hot-blooded. If she was hot-blooded, I must be careful. At this point, I decided that I was overthinking the whole thing. I needed a beer. I called Detective Green and asked him what was going on. He laughed and told me to meet with her and stop worrying. Easy for him to say as he didn't kill her brother. Continental Classics was a big impressive place. In addition to the main showroom, they had two large buildings in the back holding cars needing restoration or waiting for a place on the showroom floor. I was shocked when we pulled up to see that they were having a grand opening celebration. I wasn't expecting that. There were a lot of things I didn't understand. Terry and Todd seemed to be torn between the cars and the freebies. The first impression was the smell from the popcorn machine. A guy with floppy shoes and a rubber nose was handing out small bags of the hot popped kernels. Off to the side was a soda machine and another clown with a hot dog cart. The boys wouldn't need lunch today. It was not too difficult to recognize Angela Hawkins. I knew immediately as soon as I noticed her walking directly towards me with a slow and determined gait. Everything about her said Italian. Dark hair, dark eyes, olive complexion, and broad hips. I guess a gentleman wouldn't have noticed her hips but they were emphasized by her height, five feet even at the most. Tony was enormous and his sister was short and wide. I felt myself getting a little anxious as she approached, and then I noticed the smaller-sized clone by her side. The young girl looked to be about ten and was the spitting image of Angela, except her hair was a tad lighter, and, naturally, she didn't have any hips at all. It looked like my hostess was covering herself the same way that I did. We were a pretty pitiful pair, 
both using our kids for security. As she closed the gap between us, her hand came out in a friendly manner. Daniel Mercer, I presume? It was only natural and polite to take her hand and shake it. I always wanted to say that, like in the movie about Dr. Livingstone. She was smiling, but seemed a little nervous, which made me feel a tad better. I stood there like a mute, so she continued talking. This is my daughter, Carla. Carla smiled at the boys and I. Todd smiled back politely and said his name, but Terry held out his hand with a grin on his face. Carla, why don't you show the boys around, while I talk to their father? Terry immediately followed Carla to the showroom area, while Todd headed for the hot dog stand. I took that as a good sign. We can talk down here, or up in my office. It's your choice? I guess the office would be fine. Those were the first words out of my mouth. As we walked towards the stairs leading to the elevated office, I noticed several of the employees looking in my direction and making comments to each other. Angela noticed also, and smiled at my discomfort. The salesmen on the floor all wore blue bowling shirts for the opening, so they were easy to spot. Unfortunately, they all seemed to have more of an interest in me than they did the shoppers. One guy, at the far end of building, gave me a big smile and a thumbs up. I smiled back, but felt a little nervous. Did Detective Green tell you anything at all about my situation? I didn't reply, but I just shook my head to indicate that he didn't. I don't want to bore you with my life's history, but I think you need to know a little bit. Tony was my brother and only relative. There is no other family. When Tony died, he did not have a will. Since I was the only relative, I inherited his business. The executor took out a big chunk, but I still got more than I ever expected. I was glad to see that somebody got something beneficial out of the whole mess. While she was explaining things to me, I noticed that she had pierced ears and wore a wedding ring. There was a small silver cross hanging from her neck, but I had a hard time actually seeing it, because my eyes kept focusing on her cleavage. I just started to remember how long it had been since I had sex, when she interrupted me. Mr. Mercer? Are you paying attention? It was a trick question. She was smiling when she asked it. I am sorry. I was just admiring your crucifix. I was telling myself to look at her eyes only, and to pay attention, when she punched me in the arm. Would you like a beer? That would be a good idea. There was a mini refrigerator by the desk, and she had to bend over to get the drinks. One minute I was forced to look at her cleavage, and the next thing I knew there was a beautiful but staring me in the face. She wasn't explaining things to me, just she was trying to seduce me. Maybe it wasn't intentional, but it was damn well working. She popped the tab and handed me the can, being careful not to bend over. We each took a few swigs without saying anything. Well, Ms. Hawkins, I am glad that thing worked out for you, but I am not sure why I am here. I should be getting back to the boys before they start to worry. It would be better if you called me Angela. Can I call you Danny? Of course. Are we done here? No, damn it. Just sit there and be still until I finish. Detective Green said you would understand. I didn't answer. If I kept my mouth shut, she would get done faster. Tony was a bastard. He was a no-good son of a witch and deserved to die. As odd as it may seem, I wanted to thank you. It was trap. That damn detective was setting me up. Was the room bugged, or was it her? She could very easily have a bug hidden in her bra. Damn it, I was looking at her cleavage again. Are you wearing a wire or some sort of recording device? Of course not. Why would I do something like that? I finished my beer, though still not convinced. Maybe I better go down and see what the boys are up to. I wouldn't want them to get into any trouble. Just sit. She seemed pretty definite about that. There was no love lost between Tony and me. About three years ago, my husband was killed in an accident. He had no life insurance, and the guy who hit him had no insurance at all. I had no job skills and a daughter to bring up. Tony was my only relative, so I asked him for help. He paid part of my husband's funeral expenses, and that was it. He wouldn't even return my calls. You were telling me that his dying was a good thing for you? Yes, and apparently for you as well. Maybe we should both be thankful for what happened and let it go at that. Angela smiled and finished her beer. You don't want to talk about this anymore, do you? I nodded and started to get out of my chair. I need a favor from you. You are the only one that can help me. What could I possibly do for you? I want you to come and work for me as the general manager. You're crazy. I don't know anything at all about the car business, especially fancy cars, like you have down there. I know that. I have people to take care of that stuff. What do you need me for? Angela seemed to be a little nervous. She was looking at her feet and then at the walls. Her eyes were darting around as she tried to put some words together. Did you see how my people looked at you when you came up to the office with me? Yes. 
they weren't smiling. They all think that you killed Tony. Not only did you kill him, but you also made a laughing stock out of him when you did it. They were all afraid of Tony. It seems that they are now afraid of you. Their fear is similar to respect. Do you understand what I am trying to say? They don't respect you? No. They are going to rip me off right and left, and there is not a damn thing I can do about it. I am not smart enough or hard enough to keep them in line. What good could I do? For the most part, just be here. After a while, both of us will be able to learn the business well enough to be able to control what is going on. Until then, I need you to intimidate them. I am a nice guy, Angela. That is why Tony and my wife tried to take advantage of me. She seemed a little more comfortable now. That didn't work out too well for them, did it? For some strange reason, I found that funny and actually laughed a little. For the next 30 minutes, Angela and I talked terms. She had no trouble exceeding the pay and benefits that I was getting at the factory. If things didn't work out, I could always go back. I didn't really want to go back. I wanted things to work out. Todd was not looking too good when we went back downstairs. Too many hot dogs and too much soda. Terry, on the other hand, was having a great time. He seemed to be spending more time talking to Carla than looking at the cars. That was definitely a good sign. Todd threw up in the truck on the way home, and he skipped supper. I started work that Monday. Things went exactly as Angela predicted that they would. I was amazed at how fast I was able to familiarize myself with the operation. I got close to a few of the employees and soon had eyes and ears on the floor. The blue shirt, who gave me the big smile on the first day, was Glenn's cousin, who was my strongest supporter. Most of the employees wanted the business to flourish and were more than willing to rat out the bad apples. Angela let me handle the firings and I discovered that I enjoyed it. I was truly living up to my reputation. Detective Green stopped in for coffee several times, but the conversation was usually light and friendly. I finally got him to open up a little. Three years ago, I was a cop down in Philly. One day I came home and found my wife in bed with my supervisor. I beat the crap out of him, right on the spot, and threw my wife out. The police department gave me the choice of quitting or getting fired. A week later I had a job here. Before I left, I made sure that the son of a witch that was porking my wife got let go also. I didn't push him for any more information. It was his business. At least I understood why he seemed to be leaning on my side. The boys agreed not to mention my new job to their mother on visiting days. They made a few remarks about the long drive, but seemed to understand that there was no way out of it. I felt it was important for Marcy to see her sons, not for her benefit, but to allow me to rub salt into wounds. I know, I know, it is a rotten way to use your kids, but I got some mean pleasure out of it. Angela and I were spending more time together, at work and after work. One weekend, the boys insisted that I take her and Carla to Nobles Grove. Most of the time, we just stayed closer to home. The living arrangement seemed to complicate any chance at romance. I was definitely interested in a closer relationship with Angela, but it wasn't convenient. I was still living at my parents' house with the boys, and Angela and Carla had a small studio apartment. Since the business was doing far better than expected, Angela started talking about finding a house to buy. She spent a lot of time on the computer searching for the perfect one. I got my first wake-up call when she explained why she wanted a four-bedroom place. Danny, I think it is important that the boys each have their own room. It is better to take care of things like that now than have to do it over later. Don't you agree? Of course, I immediately realized that the question was a setup. I also figured out that Angela felt that I was more than just an employee. The potential for romance was looking better. Yeah, I think that is a great idea. I also think a split bedroom plan would be a good thing to consider. I don't like the idea of them being too close to the master bedroom. I walked out of the office right after saying that and noticed a small smile on her face. It was a strange relationship. We had never had sex or even got close to it. We had never even kissed, but I felt closer to her than I did to Marcy in 12 years. Two days later, when my divorce from Marcy was final, we all went to the Red Lobster to celebrate. The kids didn't know the reason for the party, but Angela did. Later, back at the apartment, the kids were watching a pay-for-view movie when Angela cornered me in the kitchen and stood on her tiptoes to kiss me. We were hugging and giggling a little when Carla came into the room. Whoops. Sorry, Mom. As she turned to leave, she added, it's about time. When we returned to the living room, Carla was whispering into Terry's ear and they were both smiling. Angela and I were on our best behavior the rest of the evening, but I was looking forward to whatever was coming next. The next day, while the kids were in school, Angela and I took a long lunch and went back to the apartment. 
both of us had a lot of pin-up energy to burn. We didn't get back to work until just before quitting time. There were a lot of long lunches after that, and Angela started to get serious about finding a house. Detective Green would come by to see us on a regular basis. Most of the time it was just a chat, but occasionally he would ogle the cars. He fell in love with a Studebaker Hawk that was formerly owned by Roger Ebert, the movie critic. Angela gave him a good price. Danny, I need you to take me to see Marcy. It was an unexpected request. The boys and I were making less trips than we used to, but Marcy never seemed to complain. Any particular reason? Closure. I need closure. I never understood what that meant. I knew all the words that described it, but the concept seemed to elude me. Do you want me to go with you? Just drive me up there. You don't have to be with me when I talk to her. It was a warm, sunny, fall day when we arrive at Muncie. The inmate visits were being held outside, so I parked by the fence. Ten minutes later, Marcy and Angela walked out into the exercise yard and sat at one of the tables. They were both chatting and smiling, as if they were long-lost friends. Things got interesting after five minutes. The smile was gone from Marcy's face. She was now leaning across the picnic table and scowling at her visitor. Angela, on the other hand, still seemed happy. Marcy suddenly lunged across the table and tried to grab her. The disruption was quickly squelched by several of the guards as they led my ex-wife back into the building, kicking and screaming. Angela turned, looked at me, smiled, and shrugged her shoulders before leaving the visitor's area. She was still grinning when she got back to the car. What the hell was that all about? Your ex-wife sure is a touchy witch. Angela seemed to be giggling to herself. We drove for several miles and then she turned slightly, straining against the seatbelt. I introduced myself and she seemed happy to see me. Everything was fine as long as she thought I was on her side. I admit that I sort of misled her a little at first. What do you mean? I told her that I came from Baltimore to get revenge. That seemed to make her happy because she thought I meant against you. Of course, all I really meant was that I was going to get even with Tony by taking over his business. I guess you can still get revenge against a dead person, right? Okay, but what got her so upset? She wanted specifics, such as when, where, and how. Of course, I knew she was referring to you. Now, I was getting interested. I told her that it was going to take a long, long time and asked her if she wanted me to keep her informed of the progress. She eagerly agreed and insisted on knowing exactly how I was planning to do it. When I told her how I was going to do it, she blew her stack. She lost it. She went bonkers. It was great. Okay. Okay. How the hell are you going to kill me? No. I want to know. Her smile got bigger. I told her that I was going to screw you to death. That was it. Yep. Funny, isn't it? I thought that she might get pissed, but I never expected her to go over the top. Things were quiet for a few moments. We both sat there smiling. I was so proud of her. When are you planning on starting this assault? As soon as we get to the next motel, silly. Two months later, Angela and I were married. It was a small ceremony in the backyard of our new home. Angela sent Marcy a wedding invitation with a small note inside. Everything is going as planned. You should be dead in 40 or 50 years. Dear listeners, please share your thoughts in the comments section and don't forget to like, share and subscribe.